Hello and welcome to The Winning Mentality, the podcast getting the stories behind sporting success. On this week's episode, I'm chatting to a man who's had success in numerous sports and in the business world with individuals and working as part of huge teams. To call Steve Black, almost universally known as Blackie, a coach, is barely to do him justice. He's a manager, a motivator, a change maker, a culture creator, and so much more. He's worked with a quite breathtaking list of clients, including some huge businesses, and perhaps most famously of all, he was rugby legend Johnny Wilkinson's mentor throughout his extraordinary career, which, uh, as you'll hear, was founded on a staggering work rate and desire for improvement. Blackie and I talk about his relationship with Johnny, his time at Newcastle Falcons when Sir John Hall owned them in the late 90s, as well as uh, what had changed when he returned for a second spell at the club. On a philosophical level, we discuss the importance of liking people and uh, treating them as individuals, personalising your approach to the person in front of you. We discuss the importance of recruitment and why it needs to be prioritised more and Also, simple as it may sound, the importance of winning and the importance of openly prioritising winning. We also talk about the elephant in the room, which is that teams are not working hard enough on these things. And Blackie explains why he thinks that might be. And finally, because we were talking on the final day of the Premier League season, Blackie predicts who would win it. Like with most things, he was spot on. This is a no-nonsense analysis of sporting and business success from a man who's walked the walk for over three decades. Enjoy. Uh, Steve, welcome. Uh, thanks for meeting on a Sunday morning. Much appreciated. No problem, Charlie. And uh, I'm reading, this is directly from steveblack.co.uk. Rob Andrew calls you a one-off. Johnny Wilkinson lays much of the credit for his success at your door. You've been called the best motivator I've ever encountered by Sir Graham Henry, uh, Kevin Keegan, the best one-to-one coach in the world. Do you, In your words, what do you do? Um, I just try to, help, I try to help people move towards achieving their goals. And um, if I can help them move towards their potential, that, that's what I like to do. And I also befriend people as well. And... What is most of your work nowadays? You sp- it's it's f- it's as varied as it ever was, really. Because you're known, or I know you from the sporting world, mm-hmm. but it sounds like you're doing all sorts now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I have done for twenty last twenty years, really, twenty twenty five years. Um, I probably crossed over to the world of business about twenty five years ago, as as well as sport, and it's a cross pollination, really. So, th- you know, all, all the stuff we do in the business world, you can bring it across to to sport and, uh, you know, bast- bastardise it slightly. But at the same time, um, it, it's very useful. And the other way as well, it's very useful, you know, in the dressing room and you know, team talks and all that type of thing, which, uh, which I love doing. And do you think they really transfer well? Because I've heard some people say, oh, I'm not sure if sport works in business or the same tactics work. You think they do? Well, well, they're human beings doing them, so uh, it's obvious that they do work. Um, probably people who say it, it doesn't work are probably a little bit fearful that somebody's going to move in from business <laughs> and uh, infiltrate. But it, no, but it's it, it's right. It's true. People need to have you know you have to have some sort of uh, purpose and goal, etc. And you put together a system and processes. And quality control and all that type of thing. It's exactly the same in business as it is in sport. And we're surrounded by quotes and looking at a whiteboard uh, and you've just pulled out a bag of notes that you've taken recently. And Do, do you feel like you've got an overarching, um, I don't want to say theory, uh-huh. uh, an overarching policy or are you... Philosophy. Philosophy, that's the word I'm looking for. Well done. Um, <laughs> or is that something that's just a constant search? No, well, well I, I do have a philosophy, and the philosophy is very simple, really. The philosophy is just to help people. That's it. People have said for years, what should we call you, Blackie? You know, should we call you, you know, the coach or general manager or this or that or whatever? And I'm not bothered, really. <laughs> it's the effect I'm worried about. You know, so if, if I can work with a, a team or an individual or whatever to... Um, 
to help their results get better and to get to where they sort their vision is and they want to go there. I'll only go to somewhere if we can get a compelling vision. If there's a compelling vision that they want to achieve something, then I'll go there. Um, what would you give as an example of a compelling vision? Um, well, it, it, if, if a team... For example, if we, if we went back to, say, the start of professional rugby union, um, you know, the North East uh, didn't have a great heritage in rugby, even though Newcastle Gosford won the John Player Cup, etc., a, a couple of times. But, um, you know, to become the first professional team in the world and trying to make it professional by taking what we've done at Newcastle, football team, and, uh, you know, change it around ever so slightly, whatever, and then introduce it to rugby, um, I kind of thought, that's 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 a compelling vision. What can we do? Well, we can get promoted in the first season, and I thought we'd win everything. Uh, in the second season, which we did, um, I don't think that could be done now, to be fair, but, uh, but it certainly could then. And... Uh what was that time at the Falcons like? Because you were there a long time, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Over 10 years? Yeah, yeah. It was great, actually. Really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Um, great set of players. G you know, real good lads who wanted to play well, who had already achieved greatness in some of their careers before that. So it was gelling people from all different countries, etc., to come in. Um, Sir John was very passionate. Um, he, he, he was a great owner, you know. Um, so it was a good time. And also, I, I, I was able to do things um, to bring in a culture, really, that, uh, you know, we're, we're trained to win the games. Now, you know, that's, that's a big one. Now. Because at the time, there, there, was, so, there was so much um, uh, tradition in, in the way that rugby teams trained for games. You know, that uh, we probably had the edge on everyone, really. Because I used to manage the energy, always manage the energy, you know. So it, it improved their fitness, improved their game intelligence, improved their togetherness. Uh, and with those three things in place, we, we could take on the world, really, with the players we had, you know. So what would you have described your role as at the Falcons? I mean, when you, say when you walk in in the morning. Yeah. Because I think there's a lot of, and not confusion, but people... And I know it's not wishy-washy, but people view it as they're not sure what you would actually do when you walk in the door. Well, if you said I, I would, I would organise the training from a physiological, psychological, and emotional standpoint. I would actually um, coach the game. Um, I would coach the individual performances. I would coach the individual application. I would look for total player engagement, coach engagement manager engagement, everything. Um, so it, w it would be the full, the full thing, really. So, it, you know, from a physiological background, we do all that. It was in there right at the start of the, the, the fitness industry, so to speak, from a lot of years before. Um, from a psychological standpoint, it was brilliant because there's nothing as powerful as a human mind. Um, it's also, people say it's the final frontier, and I think they're probably right, actually. You know, I, I used to say when people used to ask a question, um, what's the most important thing, Blackie? Is it the fitness, physical fitness side, or is it the mental side? And I used to say, I think it's about 80% um, psychological and 20% physical, and I got it all wrong. That was wrong, by the way, because it's about 90 95% physical. Um, Psychological, <laughs> Freudian and, about, and about five to ten percent uh, from a physical standpoint. That's not a difference. The physical thing isn't a difference, especially not at the top level. At all. So, how do you go about that, creating the mindset you want? Because um, culture is a word we hear it mentioned a yeah, lot. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, basically, you you you've just got to keep talking to people, having conversations, and listening to them. And when it's when it's your turn to speak try to use phrases that they'll remember without them knowing that they're going to remember it. And it, it's almost like a Darren Brown type thing in a way. In all seriousness. Subconscious. Yeah, yeah. You just keep putting it in there all the time. And then eventually when the, the managers, coaches, players um, are giving interviews on the radio or TV or whatever, they're using a lot of the phrases that you've put there. 
and the, the words have a uh, resonate and have words can have a hormonal effect on the body you know so it would use use words that everybody bought into and, uh, and it empowered people made people feel good made people feel that whatever the goal was they could make it and they could get there you know and uh, yesterday both of us uh, were at the the match at St James's Park you were in a box I mean we were in the we were down with the riff raff <laughs> but uh, and we saw Saracens and they've been absolute masters of creating uh, this culture and one thing that I always think when I see Saracens is that there doesn't seem to be any complacency and that must have been you were at the Falcons how long 12 years yeah. 10 12 years I mean that must be one of your biggest enemies isn't it complacency Oh, but the complacency is there for everyone. No matter what you do in life, people get complacent, you know? But how do you guard against that? You just stay on top of it. It's like w when, you're, when your mum or your grandma or whatever, when you were a kid, have you brushed your teeth? Have you combed your hair? Have you do, do you know what I mean? This needs to be done, that needs to be done, that needs to be done. You've just got to, you know, I, I kind of think the fam family-wise, fam I don't think you're going to find anybody in your life who will love you more than that. And you respect them, and you kind of do it because they say that you don't know. Now, if you uh, take that into both sport and the business world, then you can't go wrong as well. But you've got to genuinely care for people. You've got to genuinely like them. You've got to decide to like them, um, which is a, which is a big start, isn't it? You decide to like them. You don't give them time to bed in and to see whether you're going to mix well or not. You've just got to decide from day one, I like you. And then behave accordingly, you know. Um, so, if if you do that from day one, you get to know people day by day. Of course, you do, and you start the conversation start to be bespoke to the individuals. So the individuals will have goals for themselves, um, visions of the future for themselves. But at that any particular time, they're with a the team. We're kind of all be, we're all with the team, aren't we? The f first team, whatever, with the family, isn't it? And then you know, school communities and all this type of thing. So it, it's from a psychological standpoint, an emotional standpoint, it's to pull everybody together so that they'll gel all their skills and uh, you know, create a synergy that'll push forward towards achieving the goal for the team. Another element, I guess, of, of a word that comes up a lot on your website and whenever I, I read about you is motivation. Uh -huh. What's... I don't really have a specific question, but what's your take on, on motivation? Can it be coached? Well, well, I, I think, it, first of all, motivation is intrinsic. It comes from within. You can't actually motivate somebody. You can create an, an environment that will allow that motivation come from within for the person. So if the person thinks what they're doing has a benefit, then, then that's good. Then they'll be motivated. So if, if someone wants to do a particular thing, and this is a pathway to that, they'll go for it. Um, but people tend to get motivated by, um, you know, if if they feel valued, if they, and they feel welcomed and valued and part of the family, so to speak, then they'll feel motivated, you know. So and and also if they're playing to their strengths and appreciated by everyone, you know, all those words type like that, um, it's hard not to be motivated then in life, really. Speaking of motivation, I can't avoid thinking about the man you're probably most closely associated with, uh, Johnny Wilkinson. Yeah. What was that like when he, because he came up here, what, 97, 98, yeah. kind of start of professionalism. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. happened? Did they call you up and say, Blackie, we've got this young lad, can you look no, out for I him? I was already at the club then, because Johnny wasn't, uh, I, I was the first person at the rugby club. But did uh, the Vulcans say to you, we've got this young lad coming, keep an eye out for him? Take him no. under your wing, or is it just something that happened organically? No, it just it just happened sort of naturally, really. We just got together and we hit it off from day one, and actually found somebody who was as obsessed as I am, <laughs> um, and uh, it, and that, that was great. That was fantastic because Johnny would do all the right things. He would do uh, everything that you would say to every other player that's ever lived in all different sports activities. If you do that, that will happen. If you do that, that will happen. Do you understand that? Yeah. Do you think you'll do it? Oh, yes, of course. And lots of people all never do, really. Um, Johnny did, <laughs> unbelievably. I mean, what was it like when you realised what you had on your hands? 
Did, was it pretty quick when when you got your hands on him? You oh, thought this guy's special. Oh well, he, he he's he's a special person. You know, he's um, uh, obviously after <laughs> after all these years, he's he's like you know that son to me or or whatever. You know, um, and, I, and I, I'm so fond of him. He's got so much affection for him. He's a fantastic lad and a great person. You can hang your hat on him because he's consistently he's a consistently good person. He wouldn't like to hear any of this, of course, but but he is. That that's that's the main thing. He is a consistently good person, and and he wants to help his teammates get better. And if you could train all week, and he could have all the skills in the world, which he has, he has got, has did have, um, but he would only use the skills necessary to win the game for the team at the weekend. So it's never it, about him. Never about him. Never ever about him, which is. Pretty special, isn't it? And what was it like uh, having him a relationship with him for that long? Was he? I don't want to say your guinea pig, but was he kind of the the he ultimate? Looks a little bit like your guinea pig, doesn't he? <laughs> or a little hamster? Well, you said it, no. not me. Uh, but <laughs> was he was he almost an embodiment of everything you'd wanted to ach- achieve with an athlete? Yeah. Well. Well. Yes. But I, you know, I, I'd worked with uh, lots and lots of athletes before and since, uh, and alongside and all that type of thing. And, uh, um, so. It, it, it was great. I can't, you know, it was great. It was fantastic. It was emotionally superb and it was professionally superb. And I, th- I think we, we took preparation to a different level. Have you had that relationship with anyone else? Um, a few times I have, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably not as public as I want. But the, the people I have had relationships like that have all done very well as well. Either, as I say, in sport and the business world. When you look back on um, your time with Johnny uh-huh. and his career and what you achieved together, what is your reflection on it? Well, I, I, th- I think the great part about it from from my stance at this moment in time is um, when I first met him, he, he, he was uh, a youth. <laughs> and now, now he's not. <laughs> now he's... Uh, no, he's a, a grown man, and I'm very, very proud of him. Actually, is the per- I, I, th- I quite like the person thing uh, rather than just the achievement. And uh, I, I would love Johnny even if he had no one World Cups in the Samuela, because um, he always tried to get better. He always wanted to get better, and he wanted to get better for the right reasons. He wanted to get better so he could contribute to the performance of the team, you know. And he, he was, he would. He loved collaborating with other people. He loved supporting and helping other people. Um, and and uh, I mean, when we went to Toulon, he was magnificent at Toulon. You know, he, probably he the tra- best version of him. Yeah, it was. Well, he transformed everything. You know, um, by by the the example of being him. With the benefit of hindsight, that period after the '03 World Cup, when he had that horrific run of injuries, yes, probably five six years. Yeah, yeah. Do you wish you'd? Put the leash on him a bit. No, no, so no, not really, because he had car crash injuries. Right. So you know he was <laughs> running into twenty stone <laughs> um, islanders and that type of thing. Uh, and he, he actually for a number ten, he he was an astonishing tackler, wasn't he? You know, and he would so so uh, you couldn't tell Johnny not to tackle anyone. No. You know, it would it would have been ludicrous because he would have changed the animal altogether. You know. Um, I think you would have turned it from a tie end or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, no, not not really, not really. He was a big lad, could make his own mind up. Um, no, just because the popular theory you hear is he he trained too much. No, he didn't. It wasn't that. No, of course not. That's um, it, it, uh, we, we always try to put labels on things. I should say I've got no idea happened. whether he trained too much, but that's no, what no, you no, read, isn't well, it? You're getting from the horse's, horse's mouth. No, he didn't train too much. Um, he didn't. He, he trained as you should train now. If footballers trained the way that um, Johnny trained, for example, with set piece, if if we trained as much in football, taking set piece as much as Johnny did, Johnny would kick seven hundred and fifty to a thousand kicks a week. A week? Yeah, yeah. Now that doesn't happen in football. Why? Because people not do it. Because it's part of the part of the um, culture that people don't do that they just don't do that 
Um, so, it, you know, you can introduce and you can say, well, you should do this, this and this. And if you practice that for long enough, you'll be able to replicate it in the game. And then you look at Ronaldo, for example, in the World Cup. Remember when he scored that great free kick in the World Cup? And everyone said, you know, the commentator straight, straight off the training field. Fantastic stuff. Well, it was the first free kick he'd scored in 52 attempts. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. What, why Why is it that cultural difference, though? Why is football well, so different? Just people not do it. Because other people don't do it. Now, Johnny wasn't worried about what anybody else did. Johnny wanted to do it to get better. Is rugby now closer to Johnny Wilkinson in your, your observation of modern rugby? Well, I think it's getting better. I do think it's getting better, without a doubt. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the people who coach the particular aspects of the game uh, have become more obsessed with it because not just because they love it, but also because they need to be accountable for it as well. Um, and, and so I think that's, that, that's massively important. Being responsible for anything, being accountable for something, you know, you're, you're, you're shining the light on yourself, aren't you? So you, you've got to deliver, really. When, when we first turned professional at rugby, um, as I say, what, what had happened was people came from doing ordinary jobs either working in the city or working as a lawyer, an accountant, or working on building sites or whatever, and they could then devote their time, full time, to being a professional rugby player. Now, it, it was kind of, it was like Christmas every morning for them because they woke up and they didn't have to go to conventional work anymore. They could go and play rugby. Now, I thought, well, we've got half the edge here because uh, all the other people will they will be training for all the right reasons. They'll be training too hard. They'll be doing too much. Now, their bodies weren't used to that. So it, it's got to give somewhere, you know? And it actually gives in, in, in games. So in games, they were just off, just off. The energy just wasn't there. They worked hard and run around and all that stuff. Um, but actually, just getting to the ball, just making the tackle, just whatever. So they actually... Um, Probably from an aerobic standpoint, they were okay. But from an anaerobic standpoint, sharpness, agility, getting, they didn't really have that. No, I felt that we had a great mix of that then. So we, we all those years ago, were very much looking at managing energy. You can't do anything if, if, if you're tired, can you? It's very hard to be your best if you're tired, both from making a decision standpoint, executing standpoint, staying in the game, talking to people, you know, staying connected to the other players. You need energy for that, don't you? And if you haven't got the energy for that, it starts to dull the contribution. Now, we just beat everybody because we always had that. Right. Yeah, and, 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 and just to, to say, it's like a boxer. When a boxer gets ready for a fight, prob if it's a world title or whatever, probably the last 10 days or whatever, is very little done. Just walk about, walk about, maybe a little bit pads or whatever, but very little done, really, so that when they, they come to the, the night of the fight, they're on fire, ready to go. Yeah, Greyhounds. <laughs> the, I know not human, but, but greyhounds, you take greyhounds for a walk. Once in a while, you let it off the leash and pull it back. So when it comes to race night, <laughs> when the traps come up, they come out quickly. Last thing you want is the traps come and they just lie there. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense, does it? Um, so, so it, it it took mammalian physiology to be fair, um, and uh, had a look at it and say, well, you know, horses, for example, you know, if they run the derby, they don't run the derby the day before. Yeah. All, all all that stuff, um, and, and you've got you've got to remember that the the training then in professional football or whatever was just playing the game. That's all it was. Now, that, that, that's not all like that bad. <laughs> not all like that bad, obviously, because it's specific to the needs of the sport. But actually, what you can do is pull one or two different components out and make them better so that when you're playing the game, you can deal with the intensity more or you can put an intensity on the game that the other side can't deal with. We were talking uh, about Johnny, but also it's, it's, a thi it's something that's come up with a few of my guests is I'm really interested in the afterlife 
So what's it like? Are we talking, are we, are we, if we now went into religion, or uh, are you talking about after, after his career? After the career, yeah. Uh, Sorry, oh, I mean, I mean the the sporting afterlife. Oh, yeah, we are. Right. In fact, we, there's a church next door. It yeah, wasn't very yeah, clear what yeah. I meant. Yeah, we can go into that if you want. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of problem. We might do in a minute. Yeah. Uh, but no, just listening to how obsessed Johnny was, and and you are. What's it like for athletes when that's taken away? It needs to be replaced with something else. And it, it tends to need to be replaced with something where um, you can get your teeth into on a day by day basis. Oh, I'm, I'm not talking about get your teeth into it, working hard and this, that and the other. I'm talking from an emotional standpoint um, and a psychological standpoint. You've got to be able to have the mindset that whatever you're doing has worth and value um, and you're making a contribution. Now, that can be just to the family or just to your friends or uh, in, in some other way within the sporting world or on the business front or whatever, you know. Can you replace it? Um, I think it's hard. I think it's very, very difficult. Um, I think you can replace it in a better way than you, th than at first. You know, if you're totally obsessed, um, sometimes that's not healthy, really. That's, something's got to give if, if you're totally obsessed with, with, with this stuff. Um, but you can, <laughs> you can place it, replace it with another obsession if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, but no, maybe no, the, 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 the different obsession that, you, uh, that takes its place, you can be more controlled about. And you can have a greater balance. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, does, um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, it just we're, we're in your office, as I say, and we're surrounded by, or one of your uh, offices, we're surrounded by quotes, and, and it just strikes me, you can carry on obsessing about this. And the athletes have to stop. Yes, that's true. I'm very lucky, really, aren't I? Um, and, and, I, and I do, I, but I, I'm still able to get in the dressing room and I'm still be able to give team talks before games. And, uh, you know, and, and I still work one-to-one -one with people to make them better at whatever they do. Golf, you know, um, swimming, such and such, whatever, whatever. So, um, so it's not just... I, I've come out of football because I haven't. I've come out of rugby because I haven't. <laughs> you know, it tends to be I'm still involved with it all, really. How did this all start for you? Uh, when I when when I was a little lad, I loved I loved sport. So I, um, you know I was a sprinter. Um, I, I was a footballer. Uh, I turned professional boxer when I was twenty seven. Um, and then uh, it was like strongman type situation. So I played football at about 11 stone, you know. I boxed professionally at about 14 stone. Um, I lifted strength type situations <laughs> up to 23 stone. You were 23 yeah, stone? Yeah, yeah. I was six foot seven then at the same time. <laughs> but, uh, no, but, uh, you know, 23 stone for that. And had I have understood the opportunities that arise in sumo wrestling, I would have just kept eating the same. <laughs> <laughs> I would have just kept going, you know. But um, but no, that's so. But I was always obsessed with it. Now, I, d I, d I didn't make it as a footballer. Um, would that have been plan A if you'd had you had your choice? Um, not no, not really. I, w I, I thought I was George Best, so <laughs> I wanted to be George Best. So uh, apparently, I wasn't him. Um, what a loss to the game. <laughs> um, but but when I left um, Newcastle, um, I, I just I was coaching already. I was already coaching youth teams and Sunderbone football teams and all this type of thing. So my coaching just extrapolated really to all different areas of life, you know. Um, and I, I was obsessed with tactics and strategy and um, you know getting the best out of the, uh, out of people and using different systems and all manner of different things. It, it, it wasn't 424 or 442 or whatever. It, it was incredibly, ridiculously complicated. Um, but I, I, I loved it, you know. So, um, so that was there. But, and then I start finding that uh, I coached football teams and rugby teams and athletes. Um, and then I would coach their girlfriends and their wives. Um, in the, the, you know, exercising music and all this type of thing. I was in right at the start of all that. 
um, I, I was the, the national chairman of the YMCA, um, the, who at the time used to, uh, was probably at the forefront of, of the exercise to music, exercise for health, wellness type situation. So all that stuff was going on all the way through. Um, and I went, I went back to uh, university, um, I think I was 27 again, uh, to do a sports science degree, um, w which I, I thoroughly enjoyed, but it was difficult. It was difficult being a student. It was difficult being a student because stuff that's taught in textbooks aren't necessarily for real. So when you'd already done and been in, in the professional world of sport for years and years and years, you know, when, when people would suggest, f yeah, they can for the right reasons, that that's how that happened and that's how that happened, it was kind of hard just to, well, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, so and, and, it, and it just picked up from there. And it got, you know, it, the people that you were working with seemed to do well. And they mentioned it to someone else and to someone else and to someone else. And then it just filled my life, really. And how did you end up, well, maybe maybe you don't concentrate on it. How did you end up uh, so involved with the kind of motivational, psychological side of things instead of traditional coaching? Well, I do traditional coaching, yeah. No, but... Yeah. You no, no, I don't. No, no, this is, this is a fallacy. Uh, okay. I just, I'm just me. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'm just me. This is, this is kind of who I am, you know. And uh, if I work with somebody, I, I kind of realise pretty early in life if people like you and you like them and respect them and care for them, um, that's probably going to be quite a good environment to work with people, you know. Um, don't need to communicate it more than that, really. Uh, and that's what it was like. So, uh, uh, you know, I would, I, would, I, would, I would get close to people. I was never cold with anyone. Um, it was, you know, and, uh, and the young lads I had at Newcastle at the time, you know the Lee Clarks and Steve Watsons and uh, these lads. Um, great lads. I loved them. <laughs> you know, they were like little brothers. Um, so th that, that's, that's what did it. I was just being me, but I did have a strategy. And the strategy was be yourself. Be authentic. You know? Um, that's what I tried to do. So... I do coach conventionally. I know it's just you know. <laughs> I do go. I d I'm yeah. only telling you what. Um, well, I know what people say. What I understand people's that. vision of you well, is. I've, I've, I've had that said for years and years and yeah. years. And I sometimes have a little chuckle about it, and it's not a problem. It really, it's a little bit mystique there, you see. Um, but actually, you know, I coach. I coach football. I coach boxing. I coach rugby. Um, from a tactical standpoint and strategy and individual skills and. Fitness and the holistically, that's a way to put it in it. Holistically, the whole thing. Yeah. Well, this is. Uh, I asked this to Bill Bessick, and it's it's a probably an unanswerable question, but it's a fun debate. Where uh, where is? He's a nice man, Bill Bessick. Bill, yeah, he's nice a lovely one. guy. Nice yeah. One, yeah. lovely guy. Um, where is the the future gain in coaching? In and the brain. Yeah, in the mind. Uh, what form will it take? Um, you've got to bespoke, that word bespoke. If the only thing that comes out of this interview, for to go out there for you, is everything should be bespoke. It should be bespoke to even in team members. We're all part of a team. Even if you've got an individual sport that you do, you're still part of a team. You've got a coach and whatever and whatever, colleagues that you work with, but it's got to be bespoke to you. So at the top level, you should have... Everyone has bespoke coach for them, for their skills and for their lifestyle. That should be there. Every, and that's, that's not going to change. That will never go out of fashion. Other things will go out of fashion, but this will not go out of fashion. Because what's the best relationships in your lives when you think about it? Probably the one-to-one -one stuff, isn't it? Probably they're the closest relationships you have. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Now, if you can get someone that you really trust and rely on, and someone who you know has got their best interests at heart, then that's got to work. Now, obviously, you've got to know your stuff. You know, you've got to know your stuff. But knowing your stuff is not enough. It's, that's not enough. Because people only listen to you if they like you. If it's the same at school. 
You think part of the teachers that you had at school, if you liked the teacher, you probably listened to them, didn't you? If you didn't like the teacher, no matter how clever they were, it, it didn't really do it for you, did it? No, no. But how? F well, why aren't teams doing this? So you've said this. Bill Bessick said something similar. The, the gains to be made in the mind are yeah. enormous. Why are teams not uh, employing one of you for every play? I mean, I know you're, there's not many people like you, uh, character-wise. No, and but in, in, in all seriousness, I, I think uh, they're still too deep into tradition. And, and if, if they're not in tradition, they think that making major moves forward by going really scientific. Um, and, and actually, it's not as complicated as all that. So from a scientific standpoint, I'm as obsessed with that as anyone. And does it have, yes, if it's a school project or it's a research piece, great. Doesn't win any of the game on Saturday, though. Oh, people hate to hear that, though, you see. So because... They hate the, the, the idea they're not in control, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Of course. You've just nailed it. That's exactly why. But w w I suppose what needs to happen is is that people need to... <laughs> They need to become more obsessed with performing superbly, performing to an opt optimally, performing optimally. Now, results matter, by the way. Winning matters. So many times through the years, I've heard people say, oh, don't mention winning. Don't mention winning to them. It'll, it'll, is it a secret? <laughs> it's the start of a game that you want to win it. Of course not. Of course not. So, so I, I think we need to embrace that. And I think it, it, it will get a lot better. Is there still a stigma to, I don't know, I don't want to call it psychology, but to prioritising the brain? Well, well, I don't think so, because people do it in other aspects of their life, don't they? You know, you tend to do whatever hobby you've got, you do it because you want to do it, don't you? Whatever you have to eat, you tend to eat what you want to eat, you tend to what you want or what you want. Why? Because it makes you feel good. The benefit of it is it either makes you feel good, tastes nice or whatever. Um, so in, in, in sport, in football in particular, winning's everything. You know, you win five, six games in a row and people are saying this is the next England manager or whatever country you're from. You lose the next three and you're sacked. It's nonsense, man. It's absolutely crazy. You know, so... Basically, you've got. If 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 you went to work at a particular club, and you are a new manager going to work there, they should be giving you. If they really believe in you, should be giving you five years. Five years, but the, the recruitment process should be a lot more stringent. They For really managers, do. yeah, yeah, managers, coaches, every well, every every aspect, every aspect, it should be. You know, it's, it's the due diligence should be a lot deeper to find out what what the person's character is like, what they've done before, what are their values, what are their principles, or they just regurgitating something out of the last textbook that they read on some management course, or you know, throw all that out the window and just speak from the heart and see see if they can back it up. Then, then I've got to get on the training field and do and do and do whatever. Yeah, that matters. What's um, defined the best coaches and managers you've worked with? Um, the best coaches want to win. The best they're open about that. Sorry? They're open about that. Oh, totally open about yeah. it. Um, they, want to, um, they want everybody to focus on effectiveness. You have to elaborate on that. Well, they want everybody, no matter what their jobs are, to do them as well as they possibly can and to search for ways to do them better. And it's that simple. It's not simple, but it's... Yeah. It's so simple that nobody does it. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? It is that simple that nobody does it. Why? Well, why why, why, why <laughs> well, can you... You're, you're speaking to somebody who does do it, It wants to do it, It has been doing it for lots of years, and had great success doing it. But, um, but if, if, if you're working... It doesn't happen in business as much because in business you need to make a margin and you need to be successful. And if you're not successful in business, in 
making a margin, it goes out, you go out of business and people lose their jobs and all that type of thing. So that's not a secret, is it? That's not a secret. So in games as well, games are exactly the same. And as soon as people realise that, then, you know, the leagues will be get a lot closer. So at the minute, we've got it, it, the top of the league in the Premiership. It's like a league, I'm not saying anything nobody said before. It's like a league unto itself, isn't it? The bottom of the Premiership is like another league, and there's a league in the middle. So you could say, well, Wolves are, at the minute, at, what are they, seventh or eighth or something? They're like the top of that middle league. So how well have they done? Fantastic. Because that may be the definition of winning for Wolves. In Man City or Liverpool today, we'll find out who's, who's at the top there, you know, and we'll find, we already know who's staying up and who's been relegated at the bottom. So that's where it can be. I'm still of the opinion that you could get the sixth or seventh best team coached properly and they could still be competing to win the league. You think, uh, well, you named Wolves. You yeah, think they could yeah. be challenging if yeah. it was done right? Yes, I do. And I think, I th- I think they've made fantastic gains. So they're a great example of a team who've come up to the Premier League and actually played some great football, by the way. Showed a great togetherness. And if the, the, you know, they deserve where they are at the minute. I'm suggesting that if, if you get it right, you really get it right, that could be perennial. That could be consistently the case. You know? Because if you actually um, put some sort of skill test and put players from all the different teams into the skill test and all the different divisions, by the way, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell if that's a premiership player or that one isn't, or whatever. That's that's amazing, isn't it? The most skillful player might be the fifth division, non-league. They might just be obsessed with touch and pass and move, and, but they mightn't have the players around them that's, that's shown that, or they haven't had a break or whatever. You know? So it, I don't think there's a lack of talent in the game at all. I think there's just a lack of environments that allow that talent to flourish. All I'll say is, if if we took a football team and there was no politics involved, and all we had to do was prepare this team against that team, not a problem, by the way. Bring it on. Bring it on. But it's 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 become a big business now, hasn't it? The media, the the, the and it, it everyone you know gains from this. Everything there, the newspapers there, in 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 the, the media, the TV saying we think this rumor is he's going to go there, he's going to go there. He said loggerheads with the manager, this that and the other. You can only be successful if you've got loads and loads of money. Now, th- but that's obviously not true. It's obviously not true. It's just people have been sucked into Darren Brown type situation to say it only works if you've got lots of money. And it's not true that. <laughs> it is not true. You know? You can have a team that may be on a team of incredible superstars. They've got to be good players, obviously. And they've got to be dedicated and fit. And, toge- and that togetherness would make them compete at the top level. It's too easy to say um, they can buy somebody for 200 million. They can buy, they're obviously going to win. Right? Well, let's have a look at some of the players that have cost 90 odd, 100, 200 million, have they all been successful? No. Thank you. (laughs) The case rests, Your Honour. Thank you very much. (laughs) We'd like to sum up, Black. No, no, that's it. (laughs) That's your lot. That's your lot. No, but it's true, isn't it? It is true, yeah. But I'm just thinking, I mean, we're sitting here and I'm just thinking... If I employ you, I can get anyone to win the league. I'm so enthused by your energy is yeah. filling the room. But I, uh, I didn't realise, Charlie, if you've got a club. If you if you already got a club. Because I'll come and coach you to the I'm a Blackburn fan, if I mean. You if you want to, they, they need you. <laughs> um, but I, I'm just thinking back on your time, say, at the Falcons. And they did, you didn't go on to build a dynasty like Saracens or something. What... what um, <laughs> What was missing there? Because I'm sitting here thinking, we can't lose with this guy. I'm listening aye, to you thinking, aye. if he's in the dressing room, well, that's it. If you remember, being a Falcons fan. Well, because I, I, I had a season ticket for three of the yeah. years you were there. 
Well, remember, though, when, when, when I went, the time I was talking about, when I had a blank canvas. Back in the late 90s. Thank you. We won everything. Yeah, okay. Cold so what happened? Today. Politics happened. Well, I just left and I <laughs> went to Wales, Welsh national team. When did you, when did you go? To, to Wales? The Welsh national team. No, but when did you, what year was that? 98. Right. Yeah. And then when you came back, what had changed at the Falcons? Um, it was a uh, lovely club still, because it is a lovely club. It's always been, it's yeah, always felt great. like a lovely club. I, f I felt it was a little bit more social than um, than it used to be. What do you mean social? A little bit more having a great time together. Not getting drunk and all that, just having a great time together. To the point so where... Maybe it's misinterpreting, because some of the players had said, ah, oh, bloody... It's fantastic you're coming back here. God, we've followed everything you said. And we really and when I got back, they couldn't win games. They weren't winning games. Um and they're having a good time, you know, going round to people's houses for coffee and tea and you know, having a barbecue together and all that. That's all great. I'm not knocking it. But that's only an add on. <laughs> the most important thing is winning games. Now, if you can win games, because that's the greatest medicine known to man, by the way. Yeah. WWW is a cure for most illnesses. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it does have that effect on people, really it does. You sit with someone who is, uh, you know, responsible for the, the game yesterday and have just got beat, and out of this and out of that, very rare you'll get somebody who's really upbeat, you know. Um, and that shouldn't be the case, should it? Because if you do your best, I always uh, preach that. If you do your very best and you care and you give it all you've got and you don't win, well, that's kind of not a problem, really. Um, now, if you keep not winning, the players aren't good enough or the coaching's not good enough or both or whatever, but there'll be a reason for it. And then maybe you need to renegotiate for that group of people what winning is. Because winning mightn't be win, 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 win. But if you have a team that are skilled, uh, focused, there's a synergy there, born out of working together on a day-by-day -day basis, um, doing your own job and being responsible for it, but also being accountable for everybody else's, um, stand as one, and all that stuff. Uh, sometimes you shouldn't go too far away from Hollywood, you know? <laughs> No, I agree. Because no, it, 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 it does get people. That's why millions of people go and watch the movies. And it's like that. Um, and uh, we kind of respond to that a bit. You've got to change it a bit when you go abroad and work abroad. And, and, and I've worked all over the world. So you have to change it slightly. But it takes you sometimes just a little bit longer to get relationships with people. That's all. And then uh, then you've got, you've got to see how, how the... Know, people have been brought up in the local pubs and what's, what culture is sort of uh, going on in that country and change it there. If, the, if, you know, if that was the, the board there, I don't think there's enough time spent saying, Charlie, why did you make that decision? What about that? Yeah, yeah. Did you see that? Alter I've seen it black here. That alter yeah, I thought that was no problem. As long as you're seeing all those different alternatives there. Great stuff. Um, We've been going now about 17 seconds. Are you bored now, Charlie? I am, really. All right. No problem. Now, Johnny would be there for weeks. Weeks. Yeah. You know, well, what about what I was thinking of was that that could have happened. That could have happened. Had he come on that run, he was... Masterclass. Tremendous. Now, wasn't the masterclass from day one, by the way? But it got better because he practised. It got better. All right, I'm aware we've taken a lot of your time already, but la last thing I want to ask you. Yeah. You've travelled all over the world. you work with different organisations in different capacities. And, um, is there anything that you'd like uh, to do? Is there a dream project where you think, you know, I'd love to get stuck into another yeah. another I'll, Johnny I'll and another sport or a team? Or yeah, is there yeah. something where you think yeah. that's well, still the goal? All, all, yeah, all, all different type of things, really, um, in both sport and the business world. But since this is directed 
towards sport, really. Um, you know, people say, are you looking for the next Johnny? Are you looking for the next? Well, no, but because there's not another Johnny. He's unique. There might be someone who's if as effective in their own way and he has to come and something, but, you know, um, I like the world of golf. I don't like I think that's a challenge. I think golf's a great challenge. The world's full of fa fabulous players, but um, that challenge mindset, um, it, they tend to beat themselves rather than um, the opponents on the course, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm challenged by that and I'm, in, I'm enjoying working on that. Um, athletics, uh, I, I really think we could get people in the 100 metres um, running regularly 9.85. 9.9. .9. Okay. I think, I know the world track was 9.5 or whatever, but uh, I, I think there's so much scrutiny on everything now. So I think we could become the fastest stage now, continually, um, by good practice. Good practice. Um, I still love boxing. I love the fact that when, when I see that, uh, you know, we have so many good boxers at the moment, people like Anthony Joshua, who's been really well looked after, fantastically well looked after, didn't start boxing till late on, and no, he's now world no. champion. You know, nobody would realise that, watching the they really. Yeah. So it's great. So football, I'd like to win the Premiership. I'd like to take a team that's hovering and take them up there and win the Premiership. Newcastle United. That would be nice. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. But to, to do that, you'd need a total blank sheet. And that's no disrespect to what all the lads are doing there now. Um, you know, it's a, it's it, it's a strong club from a business standpoint. You know, it's a, it's well run that way, no doubt about that. Um, there's so much passion, passion on the terraces. It's beyond belief. Um, I think Rafa has done a good job, excellent job. But I, I kind of think, um, I, w I would like to have the opportunity to assemble a team that plays in the Premiership that wins game after game with the vision of being champions, not the vision of surviving. Different different thing, isn't it? Very different, yeah. Yeah, So, I, and I can understand some teams at the bottom there, that aren't very big teams, great teams, but not very big teams at the bottom, but not when you've got, if you were there last night, when you had 52,000, and you know, if we, if we had a capacity of 60 or 70,000, it'd be sold out every week if you had a good team in Newcastle. Incredible. So that does that does excite me, you know. No one could ever accuse you of not aiming high. It's fabulous. <laughs> but uh, fascinating. I, as I say, I'm aware how much of your time you've taken. I could sit here all day. But not a problem, Charlie. Uh, really really appreciate it. your time. And and uh, yeah, thank you very much. What are you doing for the rest of the day? I mean, I feel I'm, I don't know about you. I feel infused with energy. Yeah. I want to go for a run or something. I'm, um, I'm fine. Well, I'm going I'm I'm to watch your games. Obviously, on the TV. The, I mean, this is yeah on on the TV. Going to watch the games. That, Who, um, who's going to win it? Oh man, you know if 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 either team won it, I I would be happy because I, I I just think it's incredible that Liverpool could win this afternoon, lose in the final of Europe, and have almost nothing to show for. No, it's not nothing. It's not nothing. Being in the final. And being no, second the Premiership, <laughs> but not actually having the cup or whatever, it's just, it's just astonishing. Really, is astonishing. And Klopp's done a fabulous job there. Um, but Man City are a great team. I, I think the only thing that could stop them is I do think Man City are a little bit tired at the minute. Um, I think I think they're one of the best teams, if not the best team I've ever seen in the Premiership. Uh, but I, I think I think they're a bit tired. I don't think that they're firing all cylinders, not to the level that they were. The great part about it is they've still found a way to win, which 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 is special. As have Liverpool, haven't they? Found a way to win as well. Um, yeah. Right, well, enjoy. Was that me sitting on the fence? Yeah, yeah, I didn't get an answer. Yeah, Man City, you. I think. I think so Man City you will probably... go into politics. That's the arena. For yeah, you. That's, an that's answer me, like yeah. that. That's right. Good, good. <laughs> well, that's the next thing. That could When's be the next Teresa step, stepping <laughs> down? <laughs> Fortunately for the next British Prime Minister, I suspect even Blackie's talents have their limits, but I admire his optimism.
Thank you to Blackie for taking the time to chat and to his son Mark for helping us out so much with the venue and for providing an excellent cup of coffee. Uh, for more information about Blackie, go to steveblack.co.uk or check him out on Twitter, b one aki that's at B1ACKIE. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for more from us in the coming weeks.